Yes. Say it again. Is the Southern versus Northern counties for economy? Yeah, the economies. And remember, that does the geography greatly affected that with a different type of economy. And the whole thing about that is you're more plantation, more diversified in the north, and how that. Did you see that? It landed directly on my desk the first time. That reminds me of blog, but it's starting to get a little bit overwhelming for you guys. I, I know. But the geography effect of that, remember that one? Um, because the sound turn neglect allowed them to happen. Yes? Uh, the, Declaratory Act. the Declaratory Act. Why are we tardy? I forgot what time we were supposed to be in. Hmm. I'm not really sure. Honest. Socks. 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 Come on, people. We want them in the socks. Yeah. Oh, you're over the seat. And if your neck doesn't fit. All right. So, the Declaratory Act got rid of the Stamp Act. It, it, the boycott work, the Stamp Act was repealed, but Parliament said, we're still in charge. We're going to tax you again. So another tax? It, what? Tax? Well, it said we will pass another tax, which would be the township units. So another one. We're ready? It is all ready. Yes. We'll get to that in the second class, right? Because it kind of fits at the end of the book. That the same with uh, slavery, too. I promise. I promise. Anything else? Yes? British Southern Strategy. Okay, the British Southern Strategy is what we talked about yesterday. And as luck would have it, I put down asterisks for the ones that uh, will be choices for short IDs. And I thought about it and thought about it. And I decided to add Southern Strategy as a choice. Since I'm telling you as a choice, it will be one of your choices. If it wasn't one of your choices, I wouldn't have told you to get my point here. Because I'm not choosing every one of your choices. And the subject strategy, that was one from basically the late 1770s to 1781. And remember, they, the idea was they get loyalist settlement. They thought the loyalists were all filling the South. And so they attacked the, the South, and the loyalists would join them. But it turned out as the British army went through the South, what did they create? More what? More patriots. Yeah, more patriots. What kind of fighting did the patriots use? Guerrilla. Yeah, that guerrilla fight. And who is it? Who is the, uh, the swamp fox? The guy who used the swamps to hide like a fox? Marion. Yeah, Francis Marion. And who would command continental armies down there and wouldn't win a kill for Cordell's, but inflicted such horrible casualties that the Southern strategy ended in a disaster for the British. He's created more enemies. No, yeah, the fighting Quaker, Nathaniel Green. And so the Southern strategy, so that's what we talked about in class, and that'd be a good choice for short IP. And the others. Oh, and yes. So for the Wars of Empire, was that like the King Philip's War and Queen Anne's War and all that? King Philip's War, the classic example of the fur trade one. And then, but then Queen Anne's, King William's, okay. War of Jenkins here. But the most important war for empire is that French and Indian War. Because most of them ended in a draw, but the French and Indian War, the British one decides we have Quebec, and they, New France was removed. But remember, that would lead to British death, and they would try to enforce mercantilism. That's where you get the stamp out and everything else. Not bad, not quite my map. Pretty good. Pretty good. Any others? Any others? Are we ready? We can do it. <coughs> <laughs> but it's an old clock, but the, the clock I had before broke, and so I got a new one, and somebody, many, a few years ago, somebody wrote hammer time on it, so I kept hammer time on there. <laughs> it's a nice clock. It works. Until someone throws a pin on it, like that one, too. Anything else? <laughs> they just stay away from me. People don't bug me anymore, so I just let them go. <laughs> you actually know. That's really surprising. Like when I, I've broken two of those, no one really cares. Yeah. Um, it's like for 
Washington is a leader, and the big thing is, and I'll get to it today, how he would he kept the army together, and when the time came, you know, he could have made himself dictator or tried, and he didn't. And that's one of the key elements. We're dictator, we're king. Same thing. Anything else? There will be five short IDs. A couple of them will have to be from the Declaration of Independence. So I'm going to give you a few choices. But didn't I give you three choices for philosophy? For the Declaration of Independence? Yeah. yeah. Equality, pizza, and what's the other one? And what? Uh, sure. Right. And social yeah. So contract rights and opportunity and law were the ones for equality. And don't just write down, like, like liberty and pursuit of happiness. I got rights. No, that's not enough. Explain what they are, but also, it led to something. It said the British were depriving them of rights. And they would use that in the grievance section to show this is our rights being deprived, and they justified revolution. It's not enough to just have a brief little summary. You have to finish it. Related to what happened next. Show it in context of the bigger picture going on. And once you get that down, we just start thinking that way, it makes it all easier, makes essays easier, it just, it just flows. You know, talking to people took it last year, it just got easier as the year went on. Any others? Oh, and then there'll be uh, choices for, I'll uh, have some choices for other short ideas. And I'll keep choices, but you have to do them through. So there are 25 multiple choice, and then we talked about a map, right? You have to draw a map of downtown Jordan, Montana. Alright? Yeah, that's going to be easy, right? And what's downtown Jordan? Who's been to Jordan? We are so cool, aren't we? We are so cool. And what's in Jordan? It's basically street. <laughs> and what? <laughs> and, and about five bars of this Jordan. That's short. All right, so to go to any small town, the three of them are shut down. <laughs> okay, I guess we're ready. So tomorrow you'll come and write the bell and start writing. Well, you know, do the multiple choice and then. And don't forget the multiple choice. If you don't know the answer, if you're not sure, skip it, put a little dot or something, and move on, come back to it. If you waste your sh limited short-term memory on that, it will affect you as you go on. So please don't do that. No more questions from your review list? Are you ready? Okay, let's go ahead and finish up the last little bits then. So we got we got Gilbert Courthouse, right? And oh, what battle brought the French into the war? Saratoga. Yeah, Saratoga. And what animals are all over North Carolina, especially go for courthouse? Lamb yeah. walrus. Yeah, everyone knows that. And ooh, very good. Is that bugging anyone? Wait, wait. This one. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. Uh, why is your board labeled dumb board? Because it's not a smart board. Okay. So with that. <laughs> We got Southern Strategy. Oh, well, we got we some uh, Saratoga. Who was the hero of Saratoga? They would turn around and try to get West Point away. Yeah. Benedict Arnold God. That was his formal name. Yeah, Benedict Arnold. Very good. And with that, we're coming up to Yorktown. Oh, I forgot something for Yorktown. Yorktown. Now put asterisk. Before Yorktown, the issue of slavery. One of the other things that Britain was doing that infuriated Southerners, especially plantation owners, but also more so than wives, going back to the argument after Bacon's Rebellion, Britain was eagerly recruiting slaves. 
And in return for fighting for the British to return the colonies or back under their control, the slaves would get what? So ironically, the British were fighting for freedom, for oppressed people. <laughs> yes, they had a cynical reason for doing it. And they, at that time, they still had slaves in the Bahamas or Bermuda or Jamaica. But they were recruiting not just one slave, all the slaves. And recruiting slaves. And so you have this weird dichotomy, a contradiction, that the United States clearly has not resolved to this day. Here we have the American Revolutionary War fought for the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal and have unalienable rights. And yet at the same time, it was the British fighting for freedom for oppressed people. And the United States was fighting for independence so they could keep their slaves. And so you have this weird contradiction that obviously still goes with us to this day. Yeah. So Britain was fighting for slaves to get freedom? In a way. They saw that as a way to undermine the patriots that we freed the slaves. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine how the owners look. Their greatest fear was slave rebellion, but also it's their property, also their class situation. The poor whites will lose that little bit they have. And so this would ironically pull us out closer to, to the uh, North fighting for the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. Thus, contradictions. And what happened to those slaves when the war ended? Well, the British freedom. And so most of them, they, they, they evacuated. They, they, the British allowed them out. Because if they would have been caught, what would, they, they, what would have happened to the slaves who were fighting for the British? They would have executed. Why? Slaves fighting in slavery, and slavery by definition is <coughs> slavery. And that was their greatest fear. And to deter them from doing it again, they would push them. And they knew it. They are, the way they look at it, yeah, that's money, but we're going to deter other revolution. And so, and they bravely were fighting for freedom, knowing that they're, if they're caught, they're dead. That's what the, the Confederacy of the Civil War threatened uh, soldiers who were former slaves who fought in the United States, which made up 10% of the U.S. Army. And so, they, many of them, will be settled in the Bahamas, Bermuda, and Jamaica. And they would get a name called Americans. <laughs> and we'll come back to this War of 1812, too. But they're still there. And I was reading about the tragedy of the Bahamas because of Hurricane Dorian. And this article in the New York Times talked about the Americans because of the descendants of former slaves from the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. It just reminded me of flowers. I mean, they still have this kind of identity that's just a little bit different. They were free, even though there's still a lot of slaves there. So that's the issue of slavery. What about American Indians? So before we get to Yorktown, let's go and do American Indians right now. Oh no, I lied. Not do American Indians. Let's do Yorktown first. So Yorktown, what happened was this. Cornwallis advanced into Virginia. Got involved in that Civil War here. Remember, Benedict Arnold was there. And just in a couple months, Cornwallis realized this is a lost cause. We're creating too many, too many enemies. The Southern strategy was a disaster. And they got to reevaluate re everything. So his plan was to be evacuated by sea by the powerful Royal Navy, probably go back up to New York and start over. But in reality, in Virginia, that is where the British have pretty much decided it's not worth it. Their commitment to the war was dying. It wasn't worth it. We can't keep all of this and still hold on to the West Indies, a couple parts of Africa, and the biggie that they cared about. In it just wasn't worth it. So remember, what's the strategy for the U.S.? Survive. And so, why are they here? Cornwallis advances to the James Peninsula on the York River side, exactly opposite of Jamestown, at Yorktown. And there he digs in and waits for the Royal Navy. Now, this is the beginning of August. So we sit there waiting for the Royal Navy to come down. Now, the Royal Navy has a relatively small fleet up here in New York. Does anybody know what a ship of the line was at that time? Can you remember the, I talked about how they would fight on land and have one side line up and the other side line up. See, naval tactics weren't much different. In a big naval battle, 
they'd have the biggest ships. 100 years later, they called them battleships. And they would have, well, these are massive, top-heavy sailing vessels, anywhere from 80 to 120 cannon on These big, top-heavy behemoths. And if they were that big, they would line up in the ships in a line like this. Don't those look exactly like? And they would just blaze away each other. I'm really not exaggerating too much. That's kind of the tactics, just like on land. So only the biggest ships. Britain had the most, but they're spread all over. France doesn't have as many, but they just reinforced their fleet in the Americas. The British had 12 ships of the line here in New York. But in the West Indies, both the French and the British have fleets. The British have 18 ships of the line in, in Jamaica. But if they unify, that's 30. The numbers aren't as important to know that the, together, New York and the, and the fleet of Jamaica outnumber the French. The French have 19. Do you remember the Treaty of Paris? It gave, of 1763, it gave the French two islands. Remember those two islands I mentioned were really important? The French had their fleet down there, which they could threaten Jamaica and the Bahamas. These important islands, what's the crop? Sugar down there. Sugar down there. Sugar. That's the crop. And so, the French were outnumbered if the British unified. So, when <coughs> Cornwallis goes to Yorktown, in Connecticut, that's where Washington is. Half his army is what? Half his army is made up of men from what country? French. Yeah, they're French. Washington goes to the French general, and yes, his name was Rochambeau. When I say Rochambeau, what did most of you think of? Yeah. Which, by the way, should rock win every time. Right? Make for a boring game. But it should win. So, Rochambeau. Up here. Washington goes to Rochambeau and said, basically asked him, pleads with him, can the French fleet sail up here and blockade Yorktown? On this map, here's Yorktown, here's the mouth to the Chesapeake Bay. Will the French fleet sail up? Now the French know if the British outnumber them, well basically they won't even fight a battle, they don't lose. So this is an all or nothing effort because Washington's thinking, what if I march down to real quick and surround them? We blockade from the sea. Win a big victory, that might finally push Britain to finally quit. So, Rochambeau sends a message down to the French fleet commander. His name is de Grasse, but all you need to know here is, back to Yorktown, the French fleet. And they said yes. And they sail up in early September 1781. September. In the West Indies. What season is that? What does it say? Caribbean. What's that? It's hurricane season. Everyone got that? It's hurricane season. In 1781, how do you know of a hurricane? What's coming? Did you see it? Yeah, wind and also got 80 mile hour winds. Back in 1759, a French fleet was destroyed, completely destroyed by a hurricane. You're risking a lot. So the French are risking their control of their islands. The word went down to the British fleet there to unify with the fleet from New York. The commander, the Admiral Howe, he decided no. the British would not risk hurricane season and they would go three months later. They wouldn't catch that. So the British were thinking, we can't sail up there because if we're caught in a hurricane, we might lose Jamaica. So the British stay down there and the French arrive here. The British arrive from New York and they're outnumbered and they have no choice but to turn around and now they're blockaded by sea. Those two little islands, the French got in the Treaty of Paris in 1763, along with hurricane season, which saved the revolution, arguably win the Revolutionary War. So a whole confluence of events happened. So Washington, he had his men fake an attack on New York to hold the British in place, then march as quickly as possible down. Two things we ought to get from this march. Leading the march, the vanguard, so to speak, was a young French nobleman by the name of Lafayette. 
the Marquis de Lafayette. He was 19 when he came a few years earlier. Then he was now 21, 20, turned 22 while this is going on. And Lafayette came. He was a French nobleman. Well, a young nobleman. His father had just passed away. But he came over because he was inspired by the words of the Declaration of Independence. Remember I mentioned how this inspired people all over? A lot of people came over. This is nearing the time where you have people in Europe beginning to say, we want to govern ourselves. We want to have our own country. A country like Things would come up like Italy or Germany, which are coming later. And Lafayette wanted a more constitutional government in France. And so Washington just adored him. And he would be given command of the first troops that would arrive. First he fought in the, Re the, the Civil War, then to march on Yorktown. In 1830, Lafayette would come back to the United States and he'd be met like a hero. You know, Lafayette came back, and there's a lot in the United States. Like, Look how great we are. We have Frenchmen coming back. It was a big nationalistic time. Lafayette went back, and he, he helped start the French Revolution, and then barely escaped with his hand when he got radicalized. He barely, like it, within seconds of losing his head. If you go to the White House today, it was a big park right across Pennsylvania Avenue from the White House. That's Lafayette Park. So it's named after him. So they went marching, and the thing was, there's no roads. So they're just marching as fast as they can, and they're just dirt tracks. There's no bridges, so they have to cross forward through it, or walk through uh, creeks or rivers or whatever. It's just a miserable march. And the Continental Army, they just have rags on them. You know, a few of the men like Washington had a blue uniform, everybody else just rags, whatever clothes they happen to have. Yet the 5,000 Frenchmen with them, not only did they march because they were, had more training, March in better order, their camps were cleaner. They got up earlier and started marching and they marched faster. They also looked great. So as the march went on, you know, the, the cotton armor just covered in mud and dust and dirt. And the French looked great, especially considering their uniforms. What color uniform did the French have? They would copy the blue of the United States during the French Revolution. But at that time they went blue. Someone said. We had white uniforms. White wool uniforms. How do you keep white wool uniforms clean? Hmm? He's <laughs> okay, sure. No, they're walking right through the same swamps. And you can't really wash wool if you know anything about wool. Too expensive and heavy to carry extra uniform. You know how they did it? Every morning they look great. Three bleach, just so you know. Hmm? No. Why? No, but they could have scrubbed it with that. With the uh, hard valve. No, they, they're all carried a little pouch of talcum powder. And they dumped the talcum powder on, white powder, they pat it in, and they'd be white again. So they always look good. And if you hit them, they'll be <laughs> But that's how the French made it. And they arrived, they surrounded. Here's Yorktown. The British had dug in, but they surrounded Yorktown. They tried at first to take it by storm, just to attack. They couldn't take it that way. And so now, for the next month and a half, they laid siege to Yorktown, starved them out. And by the middle of October, Cornwallis was basically out of food, knowing the Royal Navy was never going to come. And actually, one of the forts on this side right here, one of the fortified areas called the Redoubt, Continental forces actually took it. The leader was one of Washington's adjutants named Alexander Hamilton, who the play has nothing to do with his life, but <laughs> that's another story. And by then, Cornwallis realized the game's over. And October 19th, so October 19th, 1781, Cornwallis surrenders. A decisive Think about it. Washington lost virtually every battle. Washington lost every major battle. But won the one that counted. And they surrendered. And once that happened, basically there were no more British forces any place other than New York, and the war was essentially over. To Cornwallis was humiliated. How we lost to these Continentals, I was let down by the Royal Navy. So the way they would surrender back in the 1780s, back in the 19th century too. You present a sword. You present your sword. The officer who said your sword to the victor. 
And so they had a surrender ceremony where the British stacked arms and then their, their rifles, arms are military weapons, so stack up their rifles, and then they're going to present the sword. Cornwallis wouldn't go. He's pouting. He wouldn't go. And so he sent his adjutant, his second in command. His second in command got there in Washington. It's fearless. What slight. And then the second in command tries to surrender to Rochambeau, the Frenchman. Better to surrender to a continental power than in the European continent, these dumb Americans. Rochambeau points to Washington. Washington wouldn't accept the surrender either. So they had to surrender to Washington's adjutant, a guy named Benjamin Lincoln. So that's how, basically, for everyone to try to save face, I know that's pretty silly. But to give you an idea how humiliated the British were, and at Yorktown, that is it. That would be the end of the major fighting, at least in the 13 colonies. Yes, there'd be fighting along the frontier, especially as they're already talking about getting a treaty organized in 1782. American Indians were still fighting on the frontier. Most tribes along, when I'm talking frontier, I'm talking the frontier of the 13 colonies. Most tribes joined who? Yeah, you ever got that? Most American Indian tribes along the frontier joined the British. They made a calculated decision, the tribes. It's bet the British will probably defend our lands better than these 13 colonies that they win. But by the way, you think the British would defend their land? What an awful position to put in. But they fought along the frontier. And so there would be fighting. And there was a group of, well, they were frontiersmen, and they had gotten their start against the, in, against the French and Indians during that war under George Rogers Clark. George Rogers Clark. He called his irregular militia, but they're much better trained rangers. And they dressed in green, and they had adopted the same tactics that the American Indians had used, uh, kind of guerrilla tactics. And what they did is, Clark's task was to go down the Ohio River to the Mississippi, attacking pro-British tribes. By the way, what is a pro-British tribe? Don't they look exactly like every other tribe? So this basically was just an expedition to attack American Indians. But it also would give a claim to this land for the United States. He went all the way down to near present-day St. Louis, across the river. They would defeat a small British force in a place called Big Sands. But they took this land. This would give the United States a claim. Everyone got that? A claim to the Mississippi. And the Ohio River... Valley that goes all the way back to the French and Indian War. During World War II, when the United States entered the war in 41, 1942, they copied the British. The British had small units that were doing like hit and run raids against the Germans, and the British called them commandos. And so the Americans, the US Army started making a unit like this too. And they called them Rangers after George Rogers Clark. And to this day, Rangers, which started World War II, they carry a little piece of paper that has George Rogers Clark's hints for fighting. And it's his, what he gave his men or told them back in 1779. And a lot still applies. And so I have a couple of former students who are Rangers. I have a couple of friends who was a Ranger too, but one of my former students is Sergeant, now in the Rangers, but he brought back a, a thing showing. I remember you talked about this. I'll, I'll send you one. He's about to send me one, but I think he might be in an undisclosed location, so I'll get him some time. Moving on. That's where that term comes from, and you might know his more famous, much younger brother. Who? Did you say Lewis Clark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, William Clark of the Corps of Discovery. Yeah, that's his younger brother. So. <laughs> The Treaty of Paris of 1783. John Adams and Ben Franklin, we already know how they are. They um, didn't really agree with each other back in 1776. 
They were the key U.S. negotiators. And when they went there, everyone just kind of ignored them. The French didn't care. The Spanish didn't care about the colonies. They were just using them to try to get back to the British. So they would end up negotiating with the British in secret. The British just wanted this thing done. And yes, their little bickering continued. Franklin was by then one of the most famous people in the world. He was in his 70s. He had a following. Wherever he went, Parisians would flock. He had tens, if not more, uh, young Parisian women who would follow him and do anything for him. They just loved him. And he used to like to walk around Paris naked. And so with that, Franklin would. Why wouldn't he? I guess he's in his 70s and he figures, what are you going to do? But, and we're in Paris. And so Adams thought he was like this degenerate, horrible person. And Franklin thought Adams was an insane lunatic. Those were our founding fathers. But they negotiated the treaty. And the treaty would be, in a way, better than they could have imagined. Because the British, they were dumb. They wanted out so then they could hold their other colonies. So the main parts, number one, U.S. is now independent. So there's a peace of Paris and a treaty of Paris? Peace means the same as a treaty. And so, yeah. I know. But when in doubt, you see that someone asked you a treaty, just guess Paris. There's a good chance you might. So. They got everything east of the Mississippi between Canada and Florida. East of the Mississippi. A huge amount of land. So you look at this map right here. That's massive. This border wasn't clear. A couple of them, like this border wasn't clear, but <laughs> huge. Actually, much bigger than they ever thought they would get. Two. Debt. Owed to the British. Must be repaid. So the colonists and the colonies borrowed money from British citizens, and they had to repay them. By the way, this debt was in the form of we call them bonds, and I'll talk more about bonds later, but that's how governments borrow money. They're called bonds. Three, loyalists will get their land back. Either loyalists can come back, a lot of them fled after Yorktown. Loyalists will get their lands. <laughs> their land. Loyalists will get their land back, or if they stay, they get to keep it. Because you can imagine a lot of the patrons are like, let's get rid of those loyalists. They collaborate with the British. And then number four. This was a real concern about all this new land. How would it stay part of the U.S. and make, um, and make the colonies work? And so the Mississippi River and Great Lakes must be open to commerce. I put an arrow there for commerce. They must be open. So the British can't use their power to keep the new United States from using the Great Lakes. And the big thing is, this is still New Spain. This is still Spain. What city? Great Lakes and Mississippi River open to commerce. What's the city that is necessary to be open to use the Mississippi River for commerce? No. So you have to write down here. The Mississippi River and the Great Lakes opened to commerce. And you see all that? Did it happen, by the way? This will eventually partially lead to the events up to the War of 1812 and all kinds of problems. Loyalists never got one. They'd have to move to Canada or move down to New Orleans. So they a few things like that. But that's the treaty. The United States is independent, but isn't yet. Washington still has to keep its army together. And one more quick thing about Washington. The same year this is going on in Newburgh, Connecticut, so Washington had the remnants of its army. 
It's called the Newark, the Newburgh Conspiracy. And this is where his army nearly met. A near mutiny of the army. The officers were tired of getting promises from the Continental Congress for pay. Yeah. The same year as the treaty, so 1783. Washington's men, his officers, were promised money they won't get. And they were talking rebellion. They want to march on Washington, D.C., overthrow the Congress, and make Washington king. They're prominence, promising us money and land. We're getting nothing. And in Newburgh, which is nothing more than this tiny little building in a tavern, Washington met with his officers to try to convince them, do not rebel. Because Washington knew if that happens and they mutiny, there's still 20,000 troops in New York. And the British can use that as an excuse to take their land back. This whole thing can still fall apart, even if they have this treaty that's being negotiated at that moment. So Washington met with them. And they're mad. You can feel the anger of this 100 or so officers crammed into this little tavern. And Washington read another letter. I'm glad you read the letter. Washington read a letter from the first time of the Congress. And the letter was basically, we promise we'll pay. We, we think you're going to rate this, you know, that sort of thing. But everyone knew it was an empty promise. So Washington started reading. And the men weren't listening. They're grumbling. Washington did. They're going to go no matter what at that point. Even if Washington tells them no. And this whole thing's going to fall apart. So Washington sets the letter down, reaches into his pocket, and pulls out his reading glasses. And Washington had this reputation of being, you know, this guy who went, went through all of this and was so strong and almost like a superhuman. You know, he had bullets nearly hit him and go through his cap and his coat and not been killed. And he stopped and put reading glasses on. In fact, he bent down and put his reading glasses and they went from grumbling to silence. They're just looking at him. And then Washington said, this war has been hard on us. And we all had to make sacrifices. And then he bent down and started to read. And he got through maybe three words, and the whole place started crying. He didn't even finish that sentence. He sat down, walked out, and immediately went right there. Washington showed, because people thought if he had need a reading glasses, it must be from the strain that he has gone through through the fight. And it represents the sacrifice they all were going to have to make to finish this war. What a great bit of play acting. He planned it. He knew what he was doing, and he rolled the die, and it worked. What town was this one? Little town called Newburgh, Connecticut. That's actually pretty amazing. And so when the treaty got back, and, well, actually, the big thing was, when the British finally left New York in 1784, they pulled out, Washington they dis discharged the army, and then he rode back to Mount Vernon and didn't become king. So Washington had a lot of flaws. He did not win very many battles, but he kept the army together, and he gave up power. Because he could have said, you know, I'll be the dictator. And they kind of had to beg him to come back. So a big step. And with that, wouldn't that be a great place to start a new unit? Because what is time for people? Marches on. New unit! The founding of the Republic! Huh? What about Abigail Adams? It's just on the list. Yeah! Is she was in the video we saw? Do you remember the video when I was on? Abigail Adams tried to convince her husband to remember women when he talked about all men being created equal. And it showed that the issue of women's rights was an issue, but for the most part, she was ignored. And ironically, women, over the next 40 years after the founding of the United States, will actually lose political and legal policies. So basically, the knowledge was there about inequality that she tried to convince her husband. Oh, okay. Actually, it's kind of funny that, yeah, I agree for you, but most women aren't as smart as you. You know, that's what he said, eh, and few people would agree, few of the other men. 
So he basically kind of listened, but in a very patronizing way. Founding of the Republic. And this goes from 1783 to 1815. This will not be on the test? This will not be on the test, but it will be on a test. Can I? So will this be Unit two? Isn't this so exciting? Soon we'll be all done. The year's almost over. Did you notice that? No. How many minutes This is what's going to happen. We're going to get back at the end of April. And you're going to say two things. It seems like God is through forever and it went like that. Yeah, to 1941. Is a big unit. 1815. And here's the thing. We call this era, this first form of government, is the Articles of Confederation. Sometimes you see it called the Confederacy. Sometimes you see it called the Confederation Congress. The Articles of Confederacy. Technically, it was a government in 1781, but really 1783, because that's when the war ended. And this personified the feeling of the 13 now states after the war. What it was is an absolute fear of centralized government, like the powerful English centralized government. That's what being R A. The fear of a strong government that would lead to the bell ringing. And then that's it. Tomorrow. Test. Sound good? I know I have the weekly schedule up. I just haven't done it. And if there's any more questions, you'll all be around before school. You guys have the opportunity to come into lunch. Do not trust anybody in previous periods. They have a vested interest for you to not as do as well. They're great at home together. Sleep well tonight. Remember, I will take bribes. They will not have your score, but I will take them. I'm impeccably honest, but I want Kit Kats. That's an option. What do you got? Kit Kat. You know, it's easy to find out. Bring Bring a couple truck loads of them there. Just, just keep. Maybe someday you'll find that number. Keep working. Keep working. And she's like, you should get more surgery.